guys. Thanks for coming to this panel on IoT and logistics solutions. We've got one more member who's about to join us, uh, Mr. Mohammed Nasser of Sprint. Uh, you want to come on up? Yeah. And we'll go down the line and have each panelist introduce themselves and give a quick elevator pitch about what they and their company are doing in the IoT and logistics space. You want to get started? Okay. Wow, the lights are really <laughs> coming at you. So first of all, thank you for the nice low chairs. I'm a short guy. Usually when I sit on one of these panels, they always put me on these bar stools and I can't get up and I fall. So thank you so much. <laughs> Alrighty, so uh, Mohammed Nasser, I'm responsible for the IoT practice at Sprint. I'm the general manager, um, having all the products and marketing as well as uh, the overall P&L. Uh, based out of uh, sunny Irvine, California, and uh, been in this role for about six years right now. The practice at Sprint has been probably going on for about 14 years. We are one of the early uh, adopters of IoT and M2M. I mean, it used to be called M2M before that, actually. They used to call it just, you know, pure old telematics. Uh, back in the day when we used to take a phone and put it in a box, and uh, we closed the box, and that was telematics. So uh, have a lot of heritage, a lot of history, but it's such an exciting time to be living in right now as we are seeing this huge, uh, you know, evolution or revolution, whatever you want to call it, take place. I am, you know, uh, lucky enough to have seen uh, how we went from a wireline type of business to wireless and saw that evolution and the data evolution and, you know, this, the big thing that had happened around it. And now I'm seeing that same excitement really taking place with IoT and M2M. And it's very, very, uh, you know, exciting for me uh, to be part of it. And I think for all of us, because it's really changing the lives of individuals as well as businesses and companies uh, on a daily basis. I mean, part of the reason why you see these big numbers of you know, 20 billion connected devices, 50 billion connected devices, it's really all about the idea of uh, that M2M and IoT really has a promise. And that promise manifests itself in uh, you're either going to make money or you're going to save money. And that is really the honest to goodness truth. And we have seen it time and time again that um, companies that have implemented IoT and, and MTM solutions, they were able to uh, automate a whole lot of things, become more efficient, save money, and while at the same time find new revenue sources and increase their productivity and, and really increase the bottom line. So this is really why this is taking place. And we haven't really seen even the beginning of it. Uh, you know, I look at what's really going to start the, the hockey stick effect. We haven't really seen it. We're just, we're just in, the, in the early stages. I think when the economics of M2M you know, gets to the level where we see today where Wi-Fi is and Bluetooth is, that's when you're gonna see the hockey stick and it's all coming, we see it very, very close and we're very, very excited. So our practice at Sprint really you know, kind of uh, lands on what I always call the three-legged stool because we go to market as a service provider, we go to market where we have um, a whole lot of companies and partners that want to come and get the connectivity from us, right? So as a, as a wireless provider, that is kind of our bread and butter. And it's a good business. It's a solid business. There's a whole lot of companies out there that's really just want to get, you know, they know their stuff and they just want the connectivity and we give them that. Then the second kind of leg of that stool is really more about packaging solutions and providing total end-to-end -end solutions in certain verticals. And we found that to be very, very important, especially in the small to medium-sized businesses where they don't want to go really big, they don't want to do you know, custom things, they want a fleet management solution, they want an asset management solution, they want a digital signage solution. So these things, having them packaged nicely, bundled in a, in a, in a way where it's all on sprint paper, all you know, the logistics we're going to be talking about, all comes together, makes things really nice and easy and simple for our sales organization as well as for the customers. That has been also a, a very good source of uh, revenue as well as enriching the, you know, our company, our, our customers' lives. And then the third one is because not the third leg of that stool, 
Not every company would you know, take just an off-the-shelf type of an end-to-end -end solution. They want some customization. There may, could be a medium-sized company. It could be an enterprise where they want to have connections back to their back end. They want to do a little bit more custom things. We have a custom solutioning team with solution engineers that kind of work with you, either take an existing solution or build one for you, you know, from scratch. And that also has been our approach. So three-legged stool, I, I've talked a whole lot about it at Sprint. Everybody kind of knows it. And we've been you know, you know, very, very successful, very happy about it. Our network has been doing fantastic. I'm, I'm, all, I'm sure you've all seen Paul, right? The guy that actually came from Verizon. I got to you know, do some of that <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> so he's also helping us on the MTM and IoT side. So thank you so much. Thank you. Elizabeth. Yes, um, my name is Elizabeth Rojas. I am working now with the Nokia Corporation, and I'm based in Washington, D.C., doing government affairs for um, Nokia. And in this role, I kind of work with the different governments in Canada, United States, and Latin America in basically educating them and helping them understand how all of these technologies work together to solve human problems. So. Um, we'll talk about the logistics and smart cities and IoT applications later on, but essentially Nokia, uh, I don't know how familiar everyone is with the new Nokia, but Nokia used to do mobile cell phones, which is why everyone remembers us for. But that part of the business no longer exists, and now we are full force, end-to-end -end portfolio, working on backhaul telecom infrastructure. So in January of this year, Nokia acquired Alcatel-Lucent, and we have doubled our size in the United States and we're working closer and closer with city mayors, with governors, uh, municipalities, and of course with the federal government to kind of like help them understand what the new company does and how can we help them enable um, all of these applications and digital solutions that will make everything more efficient, faster, and better. And there's many problems such as healthcare, utilities, energy consumption, um, and we're working a lot on that. So that's kind of my role with the company. Um, what does Nokia do as a backhaul infrastructure company? We, uh, when Nokia merged with uh, Siemens, we were only doing the wireless side of, of telecom infrastructure. Today, we do fixed, we do wireless communications, we do IP optical transport, and we also do analytics. And uh, in addition of having Bell Labs and Nokia Technologies, which are our two huge research uh, facilities, one focuses on consumers, and the other focuses on the M2N, kind of big picture, uh, high capital investments in R&D. So we're doing a lot of that. Uh, we have doubled our footprint, 100,000 employees around the world, still based in Finland, uh, but we have a headquarter in the United States in Irving, Texas, and uh, we're very, very, very global at this point, like most companies, but we're kind of leveraging the different parts of the company, the different mergers that we had. So we have a big presence in Munich, for example, big presence in Paris, big presence in uh, Finland, and so forth. Um, so IoT is huge for our companies at the heart of, of the new Nokia, and it's something that we'll be discussing more uh, later on. Mark Wells. Hi, I'm Mark Wells, uh, you can see on the slide. Uh, I'm president and CEO of Positioning Universal. We're primarily a hardware company divided, providing wireless devices for IoT applications. Uh, I'm also very excited about the uh, Internet of Things. I've been in the wireless business for 30 years, and um, I got to experience uh, a couple of decades of 40% uh, compounded annual growth of a very exciting industry, very lucky to be in this business. And um, as things are starting to flatten out a little bit, uh, um, you know, this Internet of Things uh, has popped up and uh, um, actually has been around for a long time, but has started to turn the hockey stick curve, as Mo was talking about. And, uh, and uh, my company is uh, in a position to try to accelerate that curve up the, the hockey stick uh, to, you know, get this business, the Internet of Things business, growing at that 40% uh, uh, compounded annual growth. Um, and um, so uh, jumping off on, uh, on Mo's comment, um, you know, why, why has it taken so long for this business to, to get going? We've heard lots of great things about what we can do with it. And I think that was true that we basically understood for a long time all the things we could do with wireless if the technology was there. But there's two, two aspects that we've identified that have really slowed it down. And uh, one, one has been uh, the complexity of putting together an IoT solution 
Um, you know, in the last two or three decades, uh, there, there has been IoT around. It's, you know, it was called remote sensing before, or application service providers, or, or different things. But, um, and, uh, but it was a lot, you had to know, had a lot of different know-how to get, get things put together. So the ideas people had too big of a hurdle. Um, so, so one of the things that we're doing is we're, uh, let's see, I think I have a slide here. We're putting together a, uh, all the pieces so that people that come to us to say, hey, I want to build this IoT thing, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, we can help them out with a cost-effective solution. But then when they come back again in two weeks, which they always do, and say they don't have you know, an application, they don't have device management, they don't have accessories, they don't have engineering services, we basically are providing that full a la carte uh, service capability so that, uh, so that we can help them out with the complexity. And, and also, by providing it all in a bundled package, what we're doing is getting the cost out of it as well. I mean, one of the great things uh, that we've seen in the last uh, uh, 20 years, and uh, or, you know, I've been in IoT for about a dozen years, is that as soon as the cost per unit for deploying a, that product or the subscription for deploying that product gets to the right point, because everybody's been aware of these uh, needs that could be fulfilled by wireless for so long, it instantly gets gets uh, implemented as a vertical. So you know we saw that as uh, in the vehicular the tracking market. You know that's been there's been a lot of uh, benefits that um, have been that have been uh, possible by having uh, IoT and doing tracking of vehicles, and monitoring of vehicles, and, and all that. So and logistics and and smart city. So um, so we've seen that happen and. Uh, um, and now we see other verticals, agriculture uh, is a vertical that uh, suddenly has become cost effective to do tracking of tractors, tracking of planting, tracking of moisture uh, sensing, all these things, and, and then it happens. And so, so we can actually plot out and see that as, as this uh, cost get down on the service side of things, cost gets down on the hardware, we do these bundled packages so the R&D costs are much lower, um, that there will be continue to be more verticals that, that show up. Uh, my company is um, up in the top right corner of the, uh, the matrix. Uh, we're more and more focused, uh, focused on uh, mobile type devices, uh, low power devices, uh, battery devices that are, you know, may not be a, be a touch for a long time, might be far away, uh, and, um, and focused on that. There's, there's actually, IoT gets kind of painted under one, one umbrella. Uh, the latest is IoT or IOE, uh, but I mean called many things. But there is actually a lot of variation to, the, to uh, the IoT. There's you know highly mobile devices that are only doing a small amount of data. There's stationary devices which are doing a high amount of data, like video, or a lot of sensing. And um, so there's there's a there's a lot of a lot of different uh, solutions that that need to be fulfilled. And our, my company is mostly working on uh, fulfilling the uh, a small uh, mobile type of device. And uh, so here's a picture of a, a basic IoT architecture. It's the simplest one I could find because most of them have a lot of blocks and stuff in them that look really confusing unless you're a software guy. And, uh, but basically, uh, we're, we're in the business to try to provide this, this simplified solution to basically that so that a, a, uh, somebody with an idea or a company that needs to fulfill a need, uh, you know, SME, SMB uh, type of uh, a business can have an average JavaScript programmer load the code into our device, upload the code to the web, and away they go. And they have our, our scale and our capabilities uh, that they can unleash to do on a, sm a smaller scale than they would have they could do otherwise. So anyways, I put that up there because I got that in my email the other day. It's like, <laughs> my and then I checked all the companies <laughs> I knew in IoT, and none of them were on there. So it must be probably <laughs> three or four times the number of <laughs> IoT companies out there. Um. I can't even read it. So yeah, so this is what I just talked about. It's our IoT event, and it's literally you upload to the cloud, download to the device, and you have a solution. So my question is, what are your IoT ideas? Thanks, Paul. My name is uh, Paul Washerko, and I'm the uh, general manager and vice president of the uh, Connected Assets Business Unit within CalAMP. Um, just out of curiosity, how many in the audience know who CalAMP is? So a few, a fair number. 
Um, it always, it's always intriguing to me to, uh, to find out how many people really understand what CalAMP does because we do a lot of different things that people may not be aware of. So we're one of the largest providers of M2M uh, and mobile routers uh, to the uh, IoT industry. <laughs> we have we essentially the whole stack from beginning to end, from hardware all the way through the full applications that uh, the, some of the other panelists have talked about, we provide. So it really depends on what the customer wants. And to, to Mo's point, what they do at Sprint, we do as well in a different way. We provide the hardware that goes into the vehicle or is uh, mounted on the fixed asset to provide that uh, telemetry. We also have a platform which we, al we allow, our, our devices are tightly coupled with this platform, and we allow other third parties to develop their applications on top of that. Now, what's interesting about that is we actually have and we enable competitors by selling them hardware. We also enable competitors by allowing them, them to use our CalAMP Telematics Cloud. And we think that's healthy for the industry. So I have under me the CalAMP Telematics Cloud. But I have third parties that are developing applications that may integrate with Salesforce, that may integrate with other ERP packages. I can never get to all of the applications and all of the integrations that we could possibly do. So I want to encourage third parties to develop on top of that. In addition to that, we also have on that top tier, you'll see that we have in the, uh, in the connected vehicle space, in the aftermarket space, we just acquired LoJack so earlier this year. So that actually is an interesting channel for us to drive more of these devices into the consumer channel. We also supply companies like Directa that do, that do smart start off your phone. We enable these kinds of things that are uh, maybe narrower solutions. They're for different demographics. They're from different market segments. We also think that's very healthy because, again, none of us will up here will address every part of the IoT market. It's just too immense. And I think that's one of the, one, one of the great things about it and then one of the things that fascinates me. There's plenty of space for everyone, and you may be a competitor one day, and you may be an ally the next. And so I think that's very intriguing, and I like our position in the market because of that. We also supply the OEMs, and we think that's, an, that's a part of the market that's actually going to be growing, especially like with Caterpillar. Caterpillar, we provide ruggedized equipment for them to, to mount on their, on their um, equipment for warranty purposes and to have that telemetry feedback into the, um, into the OEM. Uh, in addition to that, we also have enterprise customers that may want to develop their own custom applications. And they also might actually run one of our uh, fleet applications or asset management applications alongside that. So we also find that their companies and enterprises are going to run suites of different applications that may wind up leveraging the same data that goes through that, that cloud. There we go. Um, these are some of the companies that we supply. And again, some days we're competitors and some, some days we're allies. We supply some of the largest fleet management uh, companies in the industry, and I also sell fleet management applications both to the government and the commercial sector. We look at this as a, and th this is just an interesting graphic to show you how the, in the areas that we sell in transportation and in infrastructure and in energy, there's not just mobile, we do a lot of mobile, and primarily what, what, my, um, what my business unit does is address the mobile side, but we also, there's also fixed assets that play in there as well, and the melding of the data from those different fixed and mobile assets, I think, are what's really going to drive new efficiencies and new revenue opportunities in the future. Thank you, and last and but not least, uh, Mark Bartolomeo. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Mark Bartolomeo. I'm responsible for Verizon's uh, IoT products. And this afternoon, what I wanted to talk about is two areas that we're making a lot of investment in, in IoT logistics. So, you know, when we talk about when things absolutely positively need to be there, I think that IoT has a lot to offer in two key areas where we're investing. And I think about it in, in terms, number one, uh, probably the most important thing that we do move uh, is ourselves. 
and individual and people. And we have a responsibility to move people you know, efficiently, safely, work closely with the municipalities to do it in a way that's sustainable, that reduces uh, congestion. So in this example here, this is an area where we're investing, where we believe that, and I think as many of you do, that mobility is very quickly moving to a service mm -hmm. rather than a vehicle concept. And as we have more and more connected opportunities and more and more broadband, what this allows us to do is to interconnect all these different types of transportation opportunities so that we end up with a very highly integrated service that delivers mobility that's very contextual for you or for individuals, meaning that it anticipates your needs, it knows where you need to be, and it knows the best way to actually move you to that space uh, very safely. So in this example here, if we had a very uh, contextual, integrated system with transportation, uh, the system would know your calendar, it would know where you need to be tomorrow, it would be able to recommend the most efficient way to get to your destination. One of the biggest changes that we've seen in transportation is that very few people are taking a single mode of transportation from point A to point B. So, Many of you uh, in the morning may take a shared vehicle uh, or may take your private uh, personal vehicle to the train station, take the train station into the city, take a taxi cab uh, to the office. And so those are the types of logistics systems that we're working on today. And it's something that's complex that involves actually working closely with the municipalities to integrate municipal transportation you know, with other modes of transportation. This is something that uh, Deutsche Bahn recently launched so that when you buy a train ticket, you can also punch in your final destination and reserve a shared vehicle at the exact same time. So there's a lot of opportunity uh, for this type of transportation. The OEMs, whether it's General Motors, Ford, are inv investing very heavily in mobility as a service. Uh, the second opportunity and something that is here today that we're investing in is track and trace. This is part of the Drug Safety Act of 2013 where pharmaceutical companies will now need to start tracking the shipments of all their pharmaceuticals from the manufacturing facility to the distribution center. In 2018, this goes into effect in the EU and will also require the Pfizer's, the Merck's, the Novartis's to start tracking the shipment of pharmaceuticals to the wholesaler. And in 2021, it'll start to become more and more granular to track the shipment of these pharmaceuticals down to the dispensary, basically the drugstore or, or the pharmacy itself. The reason this is occurring, it was originally launched as serialization, uh, which uh, was deployed initially with RFID. It's very quickly moving to the cellular networks as cellular devices become less and less expensive. So we're looking at this as one of the large CAT M1 deployments that we'll see on a global basis. But in the US, we have a $75 billion per year counterfeit drug problem. So there's $75 billion worth of counterfeit drugs making its way into the supply chain for prescription pharmaceuticals. There's also, on a global basis, more than $300 billion in losses uh, with drugs, shipments that either hijack, that disappear within port facilities. And then there's also a cold chain element associated with this logistics opportunity where certain pharmaceutical drugs, particularly vaccines, aren't permitted to exceed certain temperature thresholds. So if we have vaccines that can't be exposed to temperatures above 120 degrees, and these are being exposed to 150 degrees, you know, it begins to lose its efficacy. So the two big areas that we see for logistics are ones that move people safely, uh, but also ensure that we're delivering a safe drug environment, a safe pharmaceutical sh shipment environment, but a safe food environment. And so now we're beginning to see the FDA implement the Drug Food Act. And you'll see this with the uh, shipment of farm products out in the Salinas Valley, where they want to be able to track it back to the particular fields or rows. Or even within shellfish, it's being shipped today out of Cape Cod to be able to track the temperature that shellfish is being shipped. Okay? Great, thank you. So you all have sort of mentioned uh, working with municipalities towards a smart city goal. 
Uh, Elizabeth, maybe you can start by telling us a little bit about how your company approaches your work with government at all levels and what you think government policy should look like to help uh, enable IoT and, uh, in the logistics space. Absolutely. So um, I think in terms of the policy framework and what the government should do, um, I strongly believe that the government should not force anything, but rather should have a vision of what this IoT world would look like, right? So, for instance, Singapore has been a leader in kind of envisioning how their entire government is going to be digitalized and what issues they're going to solve. So we partner with them um, recently uh, to do a narrow brand, narrow, um, narrow broadband project where we can digitalize the port and kind of bring transparency and efficiency into the system of the ports of Singapore. But Singapore itself has e-government, digital health, et cetera. But that all fed into a national kind of um, vision. Now, Singapore is small, so that's essentially kind of an example of a city. Um, in the US government, I, I have seen a lot of municipalities and a lot of cities kind of trying to bring test beds, pilots, et cetera, et cetera. You have the federal government, the federal uh, Department of Transportation doing the Smart Cities Challenge to bring some funding and enable uh, some of the cities to kind of bring competitive ideas on how they will have a smart city. But what it's missing, I believe, is how do we all work in the U.S. as a one vision of how we want the country to look like? Do we want to upgrade all of the transportation infrastructure? Do we want to upgrade all of the hospitals? Do we want to... Um, uh, digitalize the way that citizens go from point A to point B. So I, I strongly believe that we need uh, a framework, a, a vision. Of course, we need more spectrum. We need less regulation, light touch regulation, and enablers. Uh, a big important part of this whole smart city discussion is where is the money is going to come from, right? The, the governments themselves not necessarily have the funding up front, and companies cannot put everything up front either. So we have to get very, very creative in how are we going to do these public-private partnerships that are not the old model, but more of an innovative model. Uh, all of the industries are converging, so you don't have healthcare doing its own thing, transportation doing its own thing, et cetera. What the concept of a smart city is actually different IoT applications integrated into one. And so um, that's where Nokia is doing a fantastic job. We have two programs. We have um, one platform, which is called the Impact Platform, where we integrate different technologies uh, to kind of accelerate IoT deployment. And then we have another program called the N NG Connect program, that instead of Nokia coming as a vendor and partnering with Sprint or partnering with Verizon, we actually bring different players into the space of, for instance, the city of Vegas or uh, Chattanooga, which is a great example we have in the US. We just do this NG, NG Connect initiative. It's, a, it's kind of a platform where we kind of analyze the problem from different angles. So for instance, um, in Chattanooga, we put this system called 4K surveillance cameras where we track the consumer from, it, it's targeting tourism. We track the consumer from the aquarium all the way to the airport of Chattanooga. And then we kind of track facial recognition. There's an NEC was one of our partners. So facial recognition, how long is the consumer looking at certain uh, parts of the aquarium? And then with that, we bring analytics together and we partner with Intel as well. And we have a, a, a good pilot that we can probably try to scale to other cities. So in other words, it's not Nokia coming from behind and hello government, let's do this together, but rather, hey, let's bring all of the partners together because all of the industries, like I said, are converging. The regulatory system is not going to be able to look the same. And it's no longer just telecom versus you know, the other industries. It's, it's all integrated. So those are some of the things that, that we're working. We're working very much uh, aligned with partnerships. And uh, lastly, the way we um, kind of identify cities is sometimes they reach out directly to us because we have the expertise from Bell Labs. We have a big um, consulting arm there. And sometimes we hear about some of the pilots that they're doing. For instance, now in Vegas, uh, we had a public safety uh, pilot related to uh, FirstNet. And we also met up with the transportation, the regional transportation system to kind of see what are they trying to do to avoid congestion in such a big congested city such as Vegas. So that's kind of how we approach it. But you have to be very creative uh, at this point. 
Um, Mark, do you want to tell us about your approach? Yeah, so you mentioned ecosystem, and you know where we see the most effective ecosystems and where we see companies invest capital is where we're building solutions around standards. And I think that uh, when we look at whether it's smart cities or whether it's logistics, it's about defining those standards and getting the ecosystem to coalesce around that. We saw that you know, with the Energy Act of 1997, which defined the standards for the national grid. You know, we saw it with the um, Transportation Safety Act of 2005, which defined all the positive train control requirements for the class one freight carriers. You know, we saw it again you know, with the Drug Safety Act, which is defining the standards of you know, shipping these pharmaceutical products around the world. And in order to do that, people are gonna have to comply with specific standards uh, in order to improve things like sp uh, safety and efficiency. Yeah, and I would just like to add one point. So with 5G, for example, which we're piloting and testing in smart cities, which everyone is piloting and testing, this is where standards come into place because yes. once you have a successful model, you need to scale that up in order to you know, avoid error and, and have scale. So yeah, and yeah, I think standards that, are huge. Yeah, that's a, a great example of the ecosystem. So you know, we've stood up uh, about 10 markets today with 5G and we've done that uh, with our partners in order to facilitate the 3GPP standards. Mm -hmm. And what we've done is we're taking all the results from these 10 5G markets where we've deployed and then sharing them with everyone you know, openly so they can all comment on the results and comment on the standards. And the ecosystem itself then begins to drive what those standards will look like back to 3GPP. If I was to add anything about it is, uh, I mean, we have the honor to be part of the consortium of uh, partners that uh, we bring kind of smart city uh, capabilities to Kansas City, which is really where Sprint is headquarters. And I'm actually gonna be there next week talking in what they call KC Tech Week, talking about that exactly. And it's funny, we started with this probably over a year ago. And if I was to describe it in any way, I would say it's uh, the tale of two smart cities. On one side, everybody is pretty much convinced that it is the future. We're moving towards the Jetsons age. We want to actually have automated parking. We want to have automated law enforcement. We want it to have, you know, everything. Everybody says, yes, this is where we want to be. We want to provide our citizens a quality of life that actually enables them to, you know, become more uh, productive and, and, and ease of life and everything. So all of that is fantastic. So that's one tale of that city. The other tale of that city when it comes to logistics and to actually sit down and talk to the owners of each and every aspect of it, whether it's law enforcement or utilities or the parking or, so there's many owners of cities and, it's, and that has been the biggest challenge is getting everybody to say, okay, let's open up the kimono and let's work together towards that goal and it is hard. We live in a democracy and we live in a, in a place where everybody's kind of having their own you know, thing. So that has been really, really hard to kind of o overcome. But with um, you know, perseverance, I believe we will get there. But we're this running is when the vision is strategic. Strategic yes. vision from the federal, the state, and then the local government comes into place because that will give everyone a direction. Sure. Yeah. So we're running out of time. We want to save a couple minutes for audience Q&A. So I'm going to ask Paul, uh, working with as many companies as you do, what do you view as your approach to ensuring connectivity across networks and technologies in the industries that you work with? Yeah, that's a, that's a difficult one, especially as you know, you have your, your networks evolve. I've been through several network shutdowns in my career. Uh, and the end customers, they just want it to work. And so sometimes our jobs can be very difficult in making IoT work because mm -hmm. behind the scenes with all the plumbing and all the, the networks and network changes and device changes, you know, we have to make that extremely reliable. And otherwise, you get, the end user gets a sour taste in their mouth, say it doesn't work, they're not coming back for quite some time. So I think that um, the way that, that we deal with it is we have very detailed planning on how we're going to do migrations how we're going to roll out new devices to market. You talked about the cold chain. Uh, we have now the added complexity of multiple 
multiple wireless technologies that work together. You have Bluetooth, you have Wi-Fi, you have the, the, the cellular networks, you have, you have satellite. So all of these things are, have to work seamlessly together. So as we roll these out, we have to become more and more vigilant in our testing to make sure that at the next level, whether they're used by a platform or an application, that those, the, the, the data we're providing is absolutely reliable. Mark Walls, do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's funny. I, we were just having a conversation uh, myself and a couple of veterans from the wireless industry, and and uh, you know, one of the conclusions that we came to was that that uh, you know, the wireless technology as it is thought of right now always uh, you know is wireless, and things sometimes don't talk to each other, and things fail, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, up to this point in time, it's really been more about diving saves and Plan B when things don't work, and I think we're moving into a phase now where um, we have enough uh, different wireless technologies where we can have a kind of technology diversity that um, we don't have to worry about Plan B as much because um, we can use these different technologies together, especially in the IoT, especially with the costs going where they are, um, to create a more uh, uh, stable back-end infrastructure. So. Anyone want to add anything to that? Okay. Well, in the few minutes we have left, uh, are there any, audi any questions from the audience? Uh, See this side. If not, we uh, we have more questions. So, Mo, can you tell us a little bit about Sprint's approach to using big data, and uh, where do you think that might go five or ten years from now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's really kind of the the nirvana, the end goal, right? So, when we think about IoT and we think about all these sensors and uh, the billions of you know information that is really coming, the terabytes and the zettabytes and all that. Ultimately, what's really going to make the difference in the lives of human beings and the lives of companies is taking this data and making sense out of it and really creating value. So whether you you know more productive or creating something that's you know that will generate uh, good value for you. So at Sprint, um, we've started a couple of programs. One is with Pinsight Media. And that's a, you know, a kind of a, a business unit that's kind of standalone that takes the information and really right now focuses mostly on um, uh, really working on the handset side, not really on the connected devices. The second goal from, you know, because uh, it, it has to do a lot with, uh, you know, folks and subscribers. The second part or phase two would be to start really working with all of the data that is coming from the different applications. But to do that, there's also multiple enablers. So you need to have application development uh, kind of a layer that allows you to have a fleet management solution, asset management solution, digital solution, you know, a point of sale. So all of these things, when they're connected together and you're able to work with them and create value by from, from big data, that's really when it's going to hit. So I think right now we are in the probably the process of collecting a lot of data and uh, make trying to kind of understand what it is, but we have not really taken full advantage of what big data promises is. But I believe it's, it will be coming in the, in, you know, once we have more harmonization across all the applications. Does someone else have a different approach? Mark? So the way, the way that we're working with big data today is a lot of the acquisitions we're making are around ad tech. Uh, within the uh, wireless carrier you know, network, you know, there's just a tremendous amount of data that's being uh, collected. And it's a lot of consumer propensity information. Um, it's profile information. Yeah. It's uh, endpoint and destination information that's constantly being collected. So, You've seen some of the acquisitions we've done, whether it's been AOL or Yahoo, and these are consumer companies who own, build, and operate ad tech platforms. And so the opportunity for us there is to uh, deliver better advertising that's more effective, that's more within the context of that particular uh, consumer. So we've been doing some testing today you know, in New York, and we know that based on uh, people's web surfing behaviors, you know, they may uh, be susceptible to uh, allergies. And then we work with third-party data companies that are able to look at weather patterns or maybe even 
uh, certain types of allergies that are being prevalent in specific parts of the city, and then automatically push out advertising to these consumers. So you're getting maybe something like a uh, allergy medication ads that's specific to you, specific to your allergies, because that data points to you as someone who has a propensity you know, for you know, that type of disposition. And then you know, in the second piece, it's about you know, tying different logistics together is, is a very big uh, data problem you know, to really understand you know, your preferences and how to really look at you virtually so that we deliver the right services. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the power of big data in, in the machine world is, um, is, is just unbelievably strong. So one of the things that uh, you know, Sprint was not involved in, but we were kind of on, on the periphery is, and some of you probably have seen some of this, is you know, when, when children, and this is kind of always going back to you know, enhancing and enriching people's life, when children are, bo are born, sometimes they have, after they, they are you know, two or three days old, they get jaundiced, right? They get the whole yellow thing going for them and they have to put them on the lights. Well, they were able, you know, doctors working with IoT uh, application developers, they were able to find that there are certain things that happen uh, across the life of, you know, the short life, like first day of life of, of an infant, and they were able to measure the temperature and certain things that actually allowed them to predict if th this kid would have jaundice or not and give them medication ahead of time and by that saving their lives and actually saving, you know, them agony of going through all of this. So predictive analytics um, is also one of the big things that big data will, will provide as well. I'm just going to take one more uh, trial to see if anyone in the audience does have a question. Yes, sir. That's one of the big problems. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, right. when I first got involved with um, with fleet management, and we were we we're actually pitching, we actually started out as a remote diagnostics system when I ran Network Car uh, before it was sold off to Hughes. Um, and one of the things that we saw is the ability for OEMs to be able to take in massive amounts of data and almost treat it like, like the Center for Disease Control where they could, they could pinpoint outbreaks. The, the problem is, is in the data ownership. And so at that time, we knew that there, we, we really felt there was something there and that someday somebody would do something with it. You know, and, but that data ownership, um, is, uh, is really critical. And also to the point about dealing with consumers, you've got to walk a fine line yeah. where you can really piss them off. Yeah. And, and you get to the point of being obtrusive and I don't know how you determine that, uh, that point until you've crossed it. And uh, I don't know how you recover from that either. I think it's, it's a very interesting, um, it's interesting. I think it does provide great value to consumers. I think it will be worked out I think it's just, it, it has, uh, there's, there's work that needs to be done to determine those boundaries. Yeah. yeah. I think that um, I look at it relatively simply is that the only person that can own your data is you. Mm -hmm. And the, the only people who own the data are the source of the data. You own it. The only thing that you can do is give someone the right to use it which there are a number of opt-in, opt-out types of opportunities. Mm -hmm. But I think as an industry, we have to actually work to be clearer with consumers on what are they opting in for or what are they opting out of. But the data ownership always remains you know, with the consumer. Yeah. All right, we're going to have to wrap it up. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, we have another session starting in, in about eight minutes. So uh, nice round of applause for Lydia Bayuk and the panel, of course.